Welcome to Graphic Policy Radio. This is your host, Elon Levin, and this is the nerd podcast for the kind of people who wonder if Amanda Waller was the one who rolled Ali North on Iran-Contra. That's right. We're talking about The Suicide Squad. Not Suicide Squad, the deeply mediocre 2016 movie, but the non-sequel sequel, which I'll argue does a far better job of sharing the intense creativity and humor of the beloved comic series of... Ostrander and Kim Yale, Luke McDonald. Um, and joining me tonight are a couple luminaries of comics and politics and journalism who are like really the, my dream team for having this particular conversation. Joining me is Arturo Garcia. You've heard him on my show before, actually talking about San Diego Comic Con from whence he hails. Uh, Arturo is a reporter and fact checker for truthorfiction.com and the former managing editor of the late great racialicious.com, which plays the trail for analyzing how race and pop culture intersect. He has also written for the likes of Snopes, Rolling Stone, The Guardian, and there was a Rocky Horror Picture Show convention named after him. Welcome back to the show, Arturo. Hey, thanks for having me. And, you know, heck of a heck of a choice for a subject <laughs> yeah you know and um, i i i'm just like really glad it came together it was actually after i invited you that i had the moment where i said oh right and john cena was in this and you do know a thing or two about <laughs> wrestling don't you so it was like this is an even better idea than i thought um yeah and also joining me is another returning guest, Spencer Ackerman, journalist and author of Reign of Terror, How the 9-11 Era Destabilized America and Produced Trump, which is now out from Viking, getting massive good reviews, and everybody needs to go buy it right now, because that's like the requirement of being an informed member of society today. Welcome wow. back to the show, Spencer. Thank you so much for having me, Alana. Well, I knew it was it was it was going to be big when my dad, who I'm always like sending him stuff, was like, "Have you heard about this?" I'm like, "Yes, Dad, you've heard about this because I've told you about it also." <laughs> I'll sign a book for your dad if you like. Yes, I would love that. Um, and so, uh, you guys are both joining me. You know, you, you we we are people who have read many a DC comic, and um, I would certainly identify myself as being a fan of Suicide Squad. I haven't read every single Suicide Squad series that has come in the history of mankind. But I love the original from the 80s. I love everything that uh, was Suicide Squad adjacent stuff that Gail Simone worked on. I really enjoyed the recent re-upped series from Bruno Redondo and... Um, Tom Taylor. Thank you. Um, so I consider myself a Suicide Squad fan, like as much as I'm a fan of any property. And uh, I didn't see the first Suicide, Suicide Squad movie because it was clearly bad. Did either of you guys see the first Suicide Squad movie? I didn't watch the, uh, the whole of it. Um, like you, I saw the trailer, which was blatantly set up to uh you know to be the wish version of guardians of the galaxy which that'll come into play later no doubt um so i avoided paying for it but ha have i seen a lot of sequences from it yes and you know i didn't uh, unlike a movie like john wick where the watching a clip makes you want to see the full product this just <laughs> uh, this just confirmed that i was right to skip the the, the entire project and Spencer, you're, you, the, the, the Suicide Squad, the one, two, I mean, whatever they're calling it, The Suicide Squad, this is your first Suicide, suicide Squad movie as well, correct? I think that I watched a little bit of the first one and either turned it off or just decided, like, early on, this wasn't for me. And I mean, and that's crazy because it's like, guys, Will Smith cast as Deadshot is genius. And Viola Davis as Amanda Waller, while I would have liked to have seen a woman of size in the role, like she is an amazing actress of, you know, amazing talent. And at least she's not like 20, the way they drew her to be in the new 52 version of Suicide Squad. Like there was real promise in there, but then the end result was just, ugh. So when I heard they had brought on James Gunn to do uh, a new Suicide Squad movie, I, you know, I said, you know, there's, there's hope for this. There might be hope for this yet. And, um, I want us to sort of start off this episode by giving a, like a brief spoiler free, like, do we think this movie is worth people seeing? But And then we're going to get into the real thick of like, we are spoiling everything for you and talking about it at length, because I know our listeners are here because they want to hear us get really nerdy about the intersection of politics and this film, of course. So 
I guess you heard my spoiler free review version is like, I definitely think this movie captures what I loved about the original comics much better than the other one. Uh, clearly did not. Um, you know, I think this movie is a fan for anyone who enjoys Margot Rob- Robbie's uh, performance as Harley Quinn. And I'm a fan of any movie where the U.S. is clearly the fucking bad guy and women get to show leadership by showing compassion. Um, so I thought it was good. This is like not my favorite movie of the year or whatever, but I thought this was good. Do you, you guys think people should go and see this movie? And it just, I, I would also say, I, I I know it is too violent for some people and too much body horror for some people, so to speak. It was not a problem for me at, at all in those ways. But I do recognize that it might be a little bit much for for some folks. One of my friends who I really wanted to have come on was like, Ilana, I tried to watch this for you. And I understand this movie is probably good, but I couldn't do it. <laughs> so I am sensitive to that. What, where do you guys stand on the to watch or not to watch? I think uh, if you're an HBO Max subscriber, it's an, it's an easy watch. Uh, for me, it was easily in the top three of the post-Nolan uh, DC film output. Um, I, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, the, the overriding theme was, well, if you're going to make a James Gunn movie, just have James Gunn do it. <laughs> Amazing. He somehow does it better than other people who you then hire and undercut. And Spencer, would you say, generally speaking, should people watch this? Who should watch this? With some urgency. I think this was a great movie. I, you know, now that Arturo mentions it, you know, with the exception of the first Wonder Woman movie, I can't think of a, you know, post Nolan DC movie that I liked better than this or that I thought was a better piece of filmmaking than this. Mm. I really loved Harley Quinn and the Birds of Prey. Actually. Oh, I didn't see that uh, one. Sorry. Uh, maybe, oh. I should, maybe I shouldn't be so definitive. <laughs> Okay, well, you should definitely see it. It's very, 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 very good. Really? Um, Okay, if you say that, knowing, like, your abiding devotion to the Birds of Prey um, franchise, I just Mm -hmm. assumed it would be wretched, given, like, what Suicide Squad um, gave me to the point where I just, like, wanted to turn it off. But if you say say it's good, I'll I'll watch it when, when we're done recording. Yes, I highly, yeah, folks can listen. I had a, I had an episode with Sarah Century and oh, Emma sold. And Hubois okay. and, oh, yeah. and with, yeah, exactly. No, I know I had like, I had luminaries joining me to discuss it because I really, I really did think it was pretty freaking fabulous. Uh, and it's different. It's very different. I mean, the Harley Quinn of this movie is the Harley Quinn of that movie, which is great. So if you enjoy her character in this you will enjoy her in that as well. Um, and, and that also is how I saw, I, uh, I actually saw this movie at a drive-in theater up in Warwick, New York. And I was, Ooh. I sold it on a friend of mine who was uh, doing this trip with us because she loved, loved, loved Harley and the Birds of Prey. And Suicide Squad was not on her radar as a thing to see. She's someone who's not a fan of, like she's not, she's new to all of this stuff. She's just started watching superhero movies during COVID. She doesn't read comics. This is, whole thing is new to her. And she's someone who like saw Harley was like, this is a character who I suddenly care a great deal about. And I was trying to, you know, Art and I were talking about this, about this when we were prepping for the episode. I was trying to figure out like what, what made the character be so important to my friend who was like completely new and like doesn't read comics. And I think it sounds like it's a combination of her being completely shameless and magnetic, um, being sexy, but not objectified and performing amazing physical feats and just not giving a fuck. And it is, it is, it is a joy to, to watch her in this. Um, and, uh, it's been interesting to me to see sort of how the character resonates with my friends who don't come at, who don't come from nerd, this particular brand of nerddom, so to speak. Um, and, uh, my friend asked me, do you promise me that Harley Quinn is is like not going to get killed in this? And I I was like, I promise you that financial reasons why Harley Quinn does not get killed in this movie. <laughs> and then she's like, okay, I guess we can see it then. And then when she thought she might have gotten, now it's the spoiler section. And then when we she thought she might have gotten killed, she was like, Ilana, you said, I'm like, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Because like I said on my uh, Harley Quinn episode, um, I Harley Quinn's real superpower is being a Warner Brothers cartoon. And Ooh. if you're a Warner Brothers cartoon, you don't you don't die. Um, and what's amazing is now she's like legally a Warner Brothers cartoon because Warner Brothers like owns all of this. Right. Um, and, you know, like her superpower is physics don't apply to her the way they apply to the rest of the world. And she will always bounce up and be resilient and like run off that next cliff. So 
she she continued and as i've said from here on there be full spoilers of the movie so spencer yeah i mean um i don't know if you guys uh saw the space jam reboot um you know i'm someone with a six-year-old daughter so i did that (laughs) um and Uh it would have been it would have been really wonderful to have like the Batman the Animated Series version, Harley Quinn, show up in an appropriate role in a movie that's basically like an enormous catalog for WB IP. Mm. Anyway, spoilers for Space Jam, you know, the 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 reboot. Does Harley Quinn show up in it? No, she doesn't. I'm saying it would have been amazing. Oh, damn. They, they, well, I was like, maybe that could be a spoiler for it. I don't know. <laughs> So, um, you know, I think like one of the, I, what did you get? The fact that there was all basically a fake start of the movie where there's a team who gets sent in to, to their death um, wow. felt really genius to me. Um, but I was, and, and, and it's like completely in line with the kind of things that this story does. But I, even I was shocked and poked at my very friends who were with me, none of whom understood this, saying, oh my God, they killed Captain Boomerang. Because if there's one person who makes it through all the Suicide Squad comics, it's Captain <laughs> Boomerang. Um, so I, I was a little bit like, well, they killed Captain Boomerang. They're like, everybody's like, what, what, why do you care? I'm like, because he never, he's done the, every iteration of the Suicide Squad being its creepy rapist. Like, that's his thing in the comics. Art? You know, I I like that sequence. I thought it was a, a very economical way of getting the point across as to what this movie would be. Mm. Um, I I further feel that any movie will be improved by Pete Davis getting shot in the face. Yes! So, oh my God! Yes! <laughs> and, he was and so a neat, bad and good. And a neat way to use uh, Michael Rooker to subvert expectations as well, because you know, coming out of Guardians of the Galaxy, he's established as this survivor character, and you know, we meet him, and and he's this badass killing a bird you know, matter of fact, in the yard. And he goes in there and he, the poor guy just cracks. And Mm. it, you know, and a lot of movies would, would let him get away or, or or have something else in mind for him. But he, you know, he's taken out quickly. And, and, and then it's to the Jim Carroll needle drop. (laughs) Just a great exclamation point. Yeah. I, I, there were some great, there were some great soundtrack choices moments and that was that was one of them actually opening with Folsom Prison I had this moment of saying I really saying please let this not be a trailer for a new Johnny Cash movie we don't need oh thank god it's just the opening for this movie because I just really didn't want another Johnny Cash movie um I love Johnny Cash to be clear but there's been problems with the Johnny Cash movie Spencer um also given that um Michael Rooker I think is in every single one of James Gunn's films like they have a very Mm -hmm. like deep this is like one of the only pieces of movie a tri- movie trivia I actually know. Um, but like the two of them, I think also Gunn and Nathan Fillion as well, uh, the detachable right. kid, um, have mm-hmm. some relationships. So just like wonderful layered visual humor in having like neither Rooker nor Fillion get out of the first scene. It was just mm-hmm. lovely. And, you know, every movie this guy does has a tremendous soundtrack. I absolutely like, I just got a real big kick out of like, ending the thing with the culture abuse track. Uh, you just, it was real. The, um, uh, the just a gigolo sequence with Harley was, yeah. was tremendous. I, I just thought like with very few exceptions um, and we can talk about those. It, it seemed really like uh, every scene with each character down to, you know, the way the, the scenes were shot um, was just very, very deliberate. Um, for a movie that's made by, you know, a massive studio like this for part of a shared universe, it felt surprisingly cohesive, not like the product of, um, of a committee. It really felt mm-hmm. like, like it was James Gunn's movie that they let him just have it. Yeah. And it had style and it had a commitment to what it was saying and doing. Right. I I I love the ch- in the enter chapter titles, um, and I I also appreciated like 
there's one there's one reality in which this movie might have been made with Bloodsport as a real true protagonist. And I'm glad that they didn't do that because Suicide Squad just is not a series that has protagonists. Um, and I, I it was interesting, like I'd never heard of Ratcatcher one, let alone Ratcatcher two. Um, I think this movie proves that Marvel really should have made a Squirrel Girl movie by now, right? Um, because that's kind of her power set too, but with a very different social stigma of rats versus squirrels. But um, I, I, I liked. I as a person who is a, I mean, I'm a fan of Deadshot as a character. I'm not a fan of Deadshot like in real as a as a like this is a bad guy for <laughs> people. That's you're not, you're not a fan of you're not a fan of the real Deadshot. Exactly. I'm not a fan of, yeah, but as a, as a character who's, I enjoy reading stories about yeah. Deadshot. I was a little bit like, oh, are they going to recast, are they recasting the role or having him, oh, they're having him be a different character. And I was a little bit like, the character of Bloodsport is actually not as good a character as the character of Deadshot. And they're being used in the same space, like clearly. And I actually respect the decision not to just recast because I, I feel like it's a little weird to do that i i don't know that there was a good solution to it my my head um, canon for this is just gonna be that like in between movies that suicide squad with the exception of like boomerang flag and harley all bought it on some other mission yeah. and like waller mm -hmm. doesn't particularly like that she's turning to blood sport she would rather have you know dead shot there to like play this role but like mm -hmm. you know r.i.p uh what's his name floyd Floyd Lawton. Yeah. yeah. RIP Floyd Lawton. Uh hope your hope your daughter got that money. You know, I uh, did I did like the in joke that characters like Bloodsport and <clears throat> Deadshot, excuse me, and and even Peacemaker, who we'll probably get into in a bit, um, and and Savant, you know, Soldier of Fortune is a boom market in that universe. <laughs> Not just that is, universe, it, my friend. Yeah. I was gonna say, is it in ours <laughs> as well? I Although I don't know how many people doing that job were raised into it by their parents. I, I did enjoy the like whole, this is a, each person in the squad has been selected for the unique power set. I'm about to describe you to you um, bit that they did. And I think it's interesting contrast because you literally have a black British guy and a white American guy with the same origin story. And then a very different set of like life circumstances and ideology that then comes from them. Um, but we never find out why Peacemaker is in jail, do we? I mean, I assume that, you know, he's a psychopath and he just kills people. I mean, I, yes, but so do a lot of people and they're just out and about. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, he's, he really seemed like a special kind of psychopath. So I guess like, that's true. Or also, that, that you know, if you're, if I'm oh, sorry, Dan. No, you, uh, well, I mean, and again, spoilers. I, I came away with the read that he was planted there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, if yeah. not, if not outright hoarded by Waller as someone to keep in the bullpen. I was going to say that, you know, if, you know, you're Amanda Waller, um, it might be like worth, you know, like having local law enforcement, like wait until Peacemaker like runs a red light and then like give him some trumped up charge or otherwise maneuver him <laughs> into a circumstance where he ends up in Bell Rev because how useful. And, you know, it's, the thing is, like, the Suicide Squad has a history of having characters in it and in the comics who are not actually forced to be there, but who've decided that this is the appropriate thing for them to do because Amanda is, like, wielding something over their head or they have a lot of guilt or some other issues. Um, I think one of the interesting beats in this story was Rick Flagg. Um, and he, I've never been sympathetic to Rick Flagg as a character. I've always enjoyed his presence. He's an important role there. But, um it was interesting to see him being like, I didn't sign up for this. I signed up to help my country. And I'm like, did you though? I mean, I, I don't want to get too far outside. Like we, we only know what we've seen in this movie. We don't know what his politics were in movie one, but it sounded a lot like a self-justification that a lot of people really have, but that is actually, I mean, I'm, you I'm work sure with task force X. So. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, you work for task force X guy. I, I mean, I, thought, not... I think that like, you you for, you you need him as the other antipode to peacemaker. You you need someone who's kind of like not bloodsport because bloodsport is you know purely a mercenary. You need someone in that role to articulate that 
like there is someone who like deeply believes that what they are doing is the right thing for the United States, but mm-hmm. his actions are indistinguishable in like yes. fundamental, real, that is to say, moral senses from peacemakers and from blood sports. And mm-hmm. like that's how I understood Flag's role here. And at the same time, to speak to something Spencer mentioned earlier, uh, we first see Flag and Harley with the uh with you know being sent in to die. Mm-hmm. So it's very clear that uh Waller anticipated both of them she she anticipated both of them you know lashing out or or, or fighting back like they yeah. did. So that's why they that's why they were on the B team to begin with. Because she knew they could make it. No, no, no. But, um, I, I think no. the opposite. No, no. I think, yeah. Oh. No, because she, because she, no, because she knew that if they figured out what the what the real reason was, they'd fight back. Mm. So you send them with the B squad to give them the veneer of credibility, and then odds are they're going to buy it out anyway. I hear you. Um, I just don't think that she'd think of Flag as. It just seems so out of character for me that flag would be like this is a this is a step too far for the government um yeah i don't know the character well enough to say he 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 has always like particularly with like the ostrander run struck me as like that kind of functionary he's not by waller's side so consistently by accident um she needs Mm -hmm. a field leader and she can rely on him um but when i think like the way the, the the way between all our points is is probably some like brutal narrative necessity because like the plot that James Gunn creates and has you know Waller execute is just so heinous that you can't really particularly if you want to keep flag around for the movies you know we're talking about movie flag here and not comics flag mm-hmm. like there's there's no way to make him a remotely sympathetic figure if you know he acts anywhere you know near like acquiescent to to what waller wants on cordo maltese uh you know with Bloodsport, like who also acts in a shitty way um mm-hmm. like you know we've we understand that like he's not here for any kind of value thing he's here to get out of prison right he's there to save his daughter save his daughter from, from prison yes to and, and to get like, out of prison yeah and it's sp- so specifically I mean, I mean, it's really like racially charged, like having his daughter, like holding that over her head, being like, she's going to go to jail for bullshit and you're going to have to serve me to prevent that. Um, yep. Yep. And let's not forget as far as, as narrative purposes, the, the other master in this movie had to serve. Um, we're getting a John Cena show with Peacemaker. Oh, is yeah, that, that right? surprised so, me. Whoa. Yes. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. So I, I think the the cast, uh, you're right in that movie flag doesn't behave like his comics counterpart, but I, but Cena's Peacemaker takes that spot. Mm-hmm. And so to clear the lane, uh, I, I think flags, you know, we should, I, I should have, I felt I should have probably seen flags uh, eventual death coming and i'm gonna go on a limb and i would not be surprised if the the fight between them is part of at least one subplot for the peacemaker show in in that how that affects that character Hmm. well speaking of peacemaker and fights i want to talk about his kill fest with blood sport where they compete over who can kill dudes more effectively and it's this whole it's like it's like physical comedy violence gore fest and then you find out that they were killing actual freedom fighters um i have so many feelings about this but i'd love to get other people's reflections first spencer uh it was a brilliant scene it was just it in in a manner that few movies have really dared to address and like particularly through the veneer of comedy like it really sums up like what the attitude of the United States is toward really any faction in Latin America that isn't like very explicitly aligned with it. Central America, um, 
in in particular the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, it was just like so fantastically, um, arranged and, and bold, um, in the way that like, not only are they absolutely slaughtering people, people who like we see like from the start, like pose no resistance. Like we, we get all the visual clues we need, but like, because the filmmaking is so adept, like we're not immediately thinking like, Oh, wait a minute. These are anything like other than what, um, you know, we have been explicitly told they are, which is like, you know, Rick flags tormentors at that point. And peacemaker and, um, blood sport, make it all the more horrific because they are having a contest. They are killing people casually. They're killing people long, like, like there is no sense in which what registers for them is that they need to be killing people. They are trying to like show who has the biggest dick here. And Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, better American foreign policy criticism than like a lot of books. Here, here. What, what? Mm-hmm. you know um i wouldn't blame someone if they didn't like how this movie uh handled politics and you and i were talking before um going into this movie i i watched a trailer for kate with mary stewart masterson killing japanese people under neon lights and it's framed very uh this is badass this is aspirational which nothing against Mary Elizabeth Winstead, but that's you know that the the look on that still makes you wince. So I watched the, this sequence with with Peacemaker and Bloodsport, and it it conjured those up. And um, in in a lot of ways, what James Gunn did here felt snuck in, in a way that another director or another studio or another platform might not have wanted to do. Uh, but you, but so, you, yeah. But you mean that like people might find it feel uncomfortable with it. It's making a political point by having the lives of these freedom fighters discarded so carelessly, but it also isn't really giving you anything with them either. Like on the one hand, you're like, yes, this is excellent satire of the U.S. actual foreign policy. On the other hand, we did just watch you mow down a lot of brown people without like acknowledge, like without really, like acknowledging that as being a tragedy is like and yeah and you know in in the larger sense they got away with it Mm -hmm. yeah 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 the crazy thing i thought Mm -hmm. sorry go ahead do you you want to go i was gonna say well we do get to at least like there is an investment that the audience has in the freedom fighters winning in the end and we do have the woman um freedom fighter leader like actually we the movie cares enough about the outcome for her to come and to take over the palace like it doesn't completely ignore the agency and importance of what they're doing but it is it does treat their lives a, a little a little cheaply but it also treats everyone's lives a little cheaply i just sort of had complicated feelings about that um yeah spencer you were saying so i certainly thought it was weird that um that character who i you know i can't name um the leader of the freedom fighters um, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, is she named on, on camera and I'm just forgetting? Yeah, she is, but th- there's a reason you don't remember. Keep okay. going. <laughs> she really moves on from that, like it, like in kind of a, a mm-hmm. shocking way. And I think like that kind of testifies to like in that moment, she's sort of narratively written into a corner and they mm-hmm. just have to like find a way to plow through. Um, you know, I, I don't want to like remotely dispute um the point that you make arturo um i think that like it is very easy in a movie like this that does get to make the critique that it makes um to rely like way too heavily on um re- on like the way that the t- the trope works whereby like all of these people are expendable and like the moment where uh milton dies and they have mm. polka dot man like kind of articulate that like this was a human being like he had you know he, he had a soul he had aspirations he was with us this whole time 
like none of you noticed. Like I thought like that was kind of the moment when you see kind of like gun not breaking the fourth wall, but like tapping on it um, yeah. for for, yeah. for us to do it. Um and that from a political perspective, I think it is important for this movie to show that it is not just like a, a neat division between Amanda Waller's American exceptionalism, um, Peacemaker's like even more, well, Peacemaker's similarly though distinctly psychotic form of American exceptionalism <laughs> and the ones that the rest of the of the team are employing even and especially because they think they are doing the right thing because the fact that it is America deciding for itself what that thing is and to drill down even more the security state deciding what that thing is 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 a really important point that we we really want to have made I think in that scene in particular because it it really sets like a more subtle darker but also realer tone going forward when they're going to have to have the clash with Waller. Yeah, yeah. You you had mentioned to me um I I I also I th- I think another symbol that like people have taken in a lot of different ways cuz I basically googled to see who was talking about this movie having been shot in Panama because the movie was shot in Panama. Panama has been doing uh work to support its local like basically you know, the whole tax breaks to make film there thing that a lot of places do. Um, I wanted to see who was talking about specifically having this film be made in Panama and what that has to say. And there was a lot less conversation on that that I could find than I thought there would be. It was kind of a bummer. I actually reached out to a couple of Panamanian friends of mine who were like, I'm not seeing it. I'm sorry, but I would like to. But um, And one of the things that I saw someone write about from Panama on Twitter was that they thought that having all the rats come out of the city sort of portrayed their country as being dirty. And maybe it's because I'm a New Yorker, but I'm like, <laughs> everywhere was full of rats. I'm like, what do you, I mean, I, it's a different First time. It, I, 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 well, I was like, um, I, I, I like it did, but I could totally imagine some middle America person being like, oh, those dirty people. Whereas I'm like, no, this is normal. Everything is full of rats. What are you talking about? We live in a world full of rats. You have a character um, called Rat Catcher. There's no way around it. Yeah. Yeah. But I thought it was, but it was interesting sweet. to me because I was sort of just to me, I was like, well, I, I don't know. Like, it doesn't occur to me to view the rats as being an indictment. But, but Spencer, you, you had something, um, about Guantanamo that you wanted to speak to. Oh God. Okay. Yeah. So um, I guess before we get, we, there's a preliminary point that I think we, we should like maybe address um, to determine if this is even relevant, but mm-hmm. um, I read Cordo Maltese is Cuba. What, mm. what, did, what did other people think? And like, I think it by makes that, sense in, Cuba. In that in particular, I think of, a kind of American, like, you know, fundamentally anti-communist American picture of what Cuba is. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah. You know, like, that's that's what I mean by that. I do not, I am not saying that, like, we saw the real Cuba um, no, through we, analogy uh, yeah. in this movie. But I, I kind <laughs> of thought, like, that's sort of, you know, what, you know, Starro is the sanctions, basically. <laughs> Oh, sorry, was the sanctions? I love it. Yeah, I, I, the embargo, I um, yeah. yeah, I, I, I thought of. I, I think Cuba's right, especially because DC has a different country that's El Salvador. So, what, what, uh, the one Bane's from is that? Is that? Yeah, yeah, got it. Sorry, See, as, as somebody who who grew up in a Latin American country with cities, um, I didn't. I, I didn't immediately associate it with with any particular South American country just because of the of the layout, um, which is the value of having Corto Maltese or Bialia from Middle Eastern countries, and mm-hmm. that you can and, uh, you can you can goose a characterization as you see fit. Um, but if I were Panamanian, then yeah, I'd be, <laughs> I'd be a little taken aback, um, and I, and you know and and this. To me, that parallel is one of my beefs with uh, Robert Rodriguez movies in that the bulk of them take place in uh, a conception of Mexico 
that is hasn't quite gotten past 1960 in a lot of ways. Like I, you know, I, I, I grew up near traffic. I grew up near people wearing suits. I grew up, uh, near both corner stores and an ice bookstore. Right. Right. You know, I, you yeah, know, look. I, I, if you watch Mexican television, people do use cell phones. Um, <laughs> and, and, and no, and, and, you know, and, and there's, there's, and the Mexican government, and I've mentioned to a lot in the past, you know, I grew up in one party Mexico under the PRI. Um, and it was a relatively okay lower middle class existence when I was a kid. But I do remember one of the things that the Mexican government was very upset about was uh, the affectation of people using English as a sort of status symbol. And to this day, you see that play out on a lot of, like if, if, you, if you watch shows like The Club on Netflix, which is set in a, in a posh Mexico City suburb, the lead characters Americanize themselves to, to differentiate themselves from, you know, from, from the servants, the, the people, the housekeepers. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't blame anybody for, for looking at that, at, at the way Corto Maltese and that city in particular, which is supposed to, I mean, we're supposed to read it as a capital city. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, Cause you got the mansion. You know, and, yeah. That's where, you know, that's where if, the coup, anything, you know, took place. You know, and if anything, you know, Ratcatcher 2 is not thinking big enough. She could run the place, apparently. Yeah. Oh, I do love her. Oh, yeah. yeah Spencer, so Guantanamo. Okay, well, this only, obviously this only really works if um, if if Cordo Maltez is um, is Cuba, um, which, you know, if it's not and we want to think of it as kind of like an analog for something else, I'd like to discuss that as well. But like I've been to Guantanamo Bay on reporting trips a couple times and one of the like signature creatures um, at Guantanamo is this like large, like larger than a squirrel, um, larger than like probably the size of about like two, if not sometimes three, like good old New York city rats, um, call wow. that they call a banana rat. They call it a banana rat because it's excrement is like suitably reminiscent of the shape of a banana. Um, but the, the, the things are real large and, among other things that you get at Guantanamo Bay is like a lot of extremely tasteless um, jokes uh, about uh, Cuba and about the sanctions and about uh, the Castros. And among those jokes is that like the reason why there are so many banana rats on Guantanamo Bay is because like in order to escape people eating them, like they go to where the Americans are. And it's like, Ha ha, what a great joke. You've made a great joke about the way in which your embargo has so impoverished the people of mm. Cuba uh, for like the unforgivable sin of defying the United States of America for so many decades that they're starving. Like great work. And it like it occurred to me that like whatever that rodent actually is, uh, like my mind just flashed to like particularly during the scene where Ratcatcher like rat catches embargo the conquerer uh um is is like maybe those are the guantanamo bay banana rats like having their day let's talk about starro um i feel like i heard some rumor that starro was going to be in the suicide squad movie and my brain was like that doesn't make sense because starro is like a galactic scale bad guy that you know you got the green lantern corps to fight against not uh suicide squad well i i guess I guess my takeaway was that this had to have been a very young Starro to be put under captivity. And, and he, I mean, he was small in the footage we saw from, from the shuttle. Very small. Uh, but this is, you know, this is obviously not the Starro we know from the comics, um, who, like you said, had, had conquered entire galaxies, um, flooding the zone like Steve Bannon. Um, <laughs> uh, 
But I think so, it was great, though. Like, they completely sold me. Like, I just didn't know that it would be doable. I was like, well, holy shit, you guys made a, f- you made a scenario where a Suicide Squad can take down a Starro, and it makes sense. And I was just so struck by um, how great it was to have a final battle that was like a kaiju, and there was no sky anuses to be found. Like, and not just a kaiju, but a kaiju that's like saying the city is mine. And just thinking about the significance of that being the choice of words that it has. What do you mean? Well, just like the Starro isn't saying like, I will have my revenge or he's specific. He's like, this city is mine. I will control this, sp- this space and land that I've been controlled in. Mm. Um, and so you have this these different voices declaring, because he also is controlling the the citizens, right? And the citizens are then saying, the city is mine. And I think about that in terms of the fact that they had been living under dictatorship and then another dictatorship and another dictatorship. And then Starro is just the latest in a series of dictatorships in which the the people of a city are used as the organ to state that the city is belongs to the 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 invader, the one who's in control. I I thought it was like an a, a choice that like really transforms the way I'm going to think about Starro when Starro like begs the suicide squad to free it. And I, I, I don't to free the, I don't honestly know how to gender Starro. So I'll just say, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, well, what, what should we say? We should decide on something. Them. Cause Them. there's okay. a plural. Right. right. But yes. Good point. Um, well, at one point, you know, while they're, like begging for their freedom. They say that the thinker has sexually assaulted them and that right. the, the, the torture that, uh, that the thinker has visited upon Starro um, is, is, is extremely sexually violative in nature. And that's what I took away from, you know, the moment when Starro gets their revenge on, 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 on the thinker and the thinker is like talking in such of like in language of an abuser who has come face to face with a reckoning. I know I've gone too far. Uh, I understand why you're angry. I'm ready to change. Uh, and then, you know, justice comes for, for the thinker. And, and I, I, I thought that, you know, oh, poor Starro, you, you, you never had a chance in, uh, in this world. Uh, this world was, was too evil for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was remarkable that, um, for as much as Starro is the big bad, they the final line, uh, something like, uh, "Once I was free to, I was happy. Watch the stars. I, I watched this again yeah. and again. I was happy, staring at the stars, floating, floating in space. And yeah, uh, and yeah, that I mean that kind of beat is also rare for this kind of movie. Both." Um, both in the superhero sense and in in the war movie sense, right, it, right. Could 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 we, could we just say one thing about that line real quick? Mm-hmm. I didn't see them credited, but I could have sworn that was a Grant Morrison line for Starro. Am I misremembering? Um, in what, like in the recent Green Lantern or something? No, I didn't no, no. Really I, I up... seem to think it was like when um when they write Starro into JLA. The hospital issue? I it's been forever. I can't remember. But like I that that line stuck out at me as being like a particular reference. And the only writer I could think of who like would have done that, who would have given Starro such depth, uh, would would probably have been Grant Morrison. I can see that. I mean but yeah, that was so moving. And I guess you can look read that as being an example of okay, so like the US military turned this alien into a monster like it turned this creature into a dictator into a tyrant and it wouldn't have happened otherwise maybe it's very sad art well uh you and i talked about this before the show but for me the reveal scene was was a big moment not just for how squarely it puts the blame on the u.s but to have Peter Capaldi do that, do that reveal. And whereas a lot of people probably heard the doctor in that, I heard Malcolm oh, Tucker. Totally. 
Um, so that, you know, that paid off for me on a, on a very specific, specific level to have, um, to, to have Malcolm, uh, tell the audience, yeah, no, everybody here is an asshole except for the creatures stuck in, stuck in the lab. Wow. No, I think that's a, that's, that's some, that's an interesting meta, um, selection. And I, I like that how the movie is like, it think it, at first it makes you think that you think you're smart for thinking about Latin American countries relationship with the Nazis and then it's like, yeah, but what about Latin America's relationship with America and what America does there? And, and I thought that pers- was a great... Yeah, sorry. Yeah. And like, I thought that was a great pivot, the best pivot. Yeah, and like, whose allies in Latin America yeah. were the people, and South America, were the people who sheltered mm-hmm. the Nazis? Yeah. Like, why did they end up there? Oh. Um, yeah, like, I thought that was very astute. Um we should probably talk a little bit about uh, King Shark, who's obviously one of the breakout stars from this movie. I uh, have been a fan of King Shark ever since he was in Secret Six and his catchphrase, I'm, I'm a, a shark. shark. Um, I I just, it's so, just I'm talking about like the whiplash between sympathy and frustration and i'm like because he's an animal i'm never gonna not be like oh he's an animal i want to hug the animal um and then he's like eating it's he's he, stallone sylvester stallone doing yeah. the voice it's fucking yeah, it genius was perfect. it was so good and his whole thing with the sucker fish like i it really that hurt me i like it hurt me i almost cried i for like I felt bad for everyone. I felt bad for the shark who was going to have his magical princess moment with a sparkly fish. Like this movie understands having a magical princess moment. I mean, it had so many great magical princess moments for Harley. You know, King Shark was going to have his magical princess moment where he communes with the fish and then they go and they eat him. I felt bad for everyone. What I hope will happen if they end up giving Gunn yet another Suicide Squad movie is like much in the way that we got to uh smart hulk doctor you know dr green doc green Mm -hmm. doc green um i hope we get to the gail simone king shark for the next one that like he goes Mm -hmm. through an upgrade he's now reading the book right side up and we can get like the way gail wrote king shark there's something so heartbreaking with him reading the book upside down it's like and there's and there's also with weasel like there's a couple of animals here where you're like you are animals who've been forced to live as people in a human world and are being forced and policed to like act as humans do and that's not fair to you like even though weasel did kill 75 children like weasel is still like an animal actually he's not actually people and it's not okay to like judge an animal by the standards of responsibility that we give for humans um and uh i was really glad he didn't die art you know i thought weasel was one of the rare missteps for the movie in that i the the character the character the character's actions did not match the backstory so i don't know if it was like it's supposed to be like a steve buscemi and con air we just see him on a really mellow day (laughs) <laughs> um, you know, because I don't, I didn't see that character going Anakin Skywalker on a bunch of younglings, personally. <laughs> um, as, as far as King Shark, I, I'm gonna be the naysayer here and and say I was kind of neutral on him. Hmm. I'm more of a fan of Ron Funches taking the character. Oh, that's a very different King Shark in the animated in the uh, the, the Harley Quinn animated show. Yeah. So, but you know, I I like that. Um, the the question of his of his family came up in that show and and he's dealing with it and he's making friends with this bunch of jerks um so that i mean that's just that i think i'm more of a bunch of loyalist as far as as Anawe <laughs> goes i didn't even remember he had a name other than king shark i was like dude but hell i didn't remember polka dot man and i didn't know rat catcher too and like i know some pretty fucking deep dive dc villains although often i know them be- because i read a lot of suicide squad and secret six um but uh i was like they, they what what did you guys think about this the movie's selection of uh which particular bad guys it used and worked with uh, delectable i i loved that there were all of these dc characters that 
I have never heard of, not interested in entirely like, you know, I mean, and those that I have heard of um, are, you know, ludicrous to put in a movie like this, like, you know, Mongal. Um, that was, you know, it's, it, it's just James Gunn, like having a tremendous amount of fun showing that he's, you know, utterly uninterested in like presenting these guys as anything, but what they are like, you know, fundamentally, this is a, you know, the, the template is dirty dozen, right? This is, mm-hmm. this is, you know, dirty dozen, um, everyone is expendable. Uh, and so like, we shouldn't sweat it too much um we should like really allow ourselves to like have some fun that like this is you know pretty much like a harley quinn peacemaker movie um with idris elba in a character that like i've never heard of i'm not interested in Mm -hmm. reading a comic about you know like i i i loved that i it was you know from the choice not to like you were saying earlier recast deadshot or like pay will smith (laughs) you know i don't know um they just decide like, eh, we'll find a functionally similar character somewhere in the in the depths of the DC. In the world. annals. Yeah. Like, yes. Maybe they bought it from. Oh, mm-hmm. is that one? Is that one a wild story? Oh, but no. But I mean, he, he could the, the, the Predator helmet and all. He could instantly pass for a, a Rob Liefeld image. image oh, comic. yeah. Well, Peacemaker is from Charlton, right? Like there's a. Yes. I don't know. Um, and that was the one. Um. That was the casting and the character I had my eye on for my own selfish reasons. What are those reasons? Well, I mean, I'm a I'm a long time pro wrestling fan, and you know, a, a, I think if you ask many of us, dozens of us, many of us, <laughs> th- they would have wanted to see John Cena play a villain years ago in the ring, mm. um, but it didn't materialize. You know, you could argue for off-camera reasons. Uh, his he sold a ton of merchandise to a younger demo. He was a remarkably consistent uh, Make a Wish participant. You know, he was the ultimate company representative to the, to the point of learning Chinese um, at the age of forty plus to represent the company in their business dealings there. Um, and it's a it's it's part of a very strange relationship that wrestling. And WWE World Wrestling Entertainment has had with this fan bases for years now. Um, but this role, the, this role and the way it shook out and it going into this show, um, I, to me, it's a potential, uh, turning point for Cena as an actor. Mm-hmm. I know nothing about wrestling. It's never been my thing. Um, I just love John Cena and Will for Life. Like his, his comic timing is is just tremendous. His charisma is undeniable. Um, I think like the first time I saw him act um, was in um, the Amy Schumer train wreck movie. And he was just like hysterical, like jaw droppingly funny. Um, and, you know, he, he was he was born to do this. Like he was born to play like a giant, dumb, like inadvertently very funny psycho. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What a, what a unit. What a unit that man is. We got to see uh we got to see him wearing practically nothing and I was <laughs> entirely here for it. <laughs> oh god. Well, I we should we should talk about Harley Quinn's sexcapade then. Um I I appreciate I always appreciate when a movie acknowledges someone is hot who's not generic hot, which would be the uh young dictator who she briefly is romanced by. Um and uh, it was interesting because, like, the movie goes so full on with the violence, um, you know, creatively. I mean, Boomerang and, like, Blackguard getting his face cut off and everything. But they're just like, the, the sex scene, like, we might show his butt for two seconds and just that you guys have finished having sex. So it is still, it's a sort of like, that is sort of a remnant of it still being a Hollywood superhero movie that, like, you can't have sex really. But... I thought that um, the whole whirlwind romance that Harley has, like her princess fantasy, and then real, and then saying like, "Yeah, but you're like a fucking dictator, so I'm actually not going to do that," was such a really genius bit of like 
understanding her character growth. And um, I, I wanted her to have that fun adventure and like have that sex and then kill that guy. It was like, yes, have your best day, which includes all of those things. I, and just like, you know, killing kids, kind of a red flag. Um, yeah. Like that was really like a, a wonderful commentary, I thought. I'm like, obviously, I didn't like stick around to see how they did that you know, movie the first time, but it seemed to be, and I'll take your word and go watch uh, Birds of Prey, mm-hmm. like her commenting on like, yeah, my taste in men is like not really great. My experiences is terrible and I've, I'm growing from it rather than being defined by it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But here's the thing, like she doesn't kill him because he's a dictator. She sleeps with him knowing he's a dictator. Right. She kills him re- realizing the implications of him being a dictator. Like, I don't know that she would, she wouldn't understand that in the political terms that I just used, but that is actually what it is. Well, I mean, I, I, Arturo, why don't you go? And then I want to ask, ask some questions, like poking at like the political alignments of the various um, factions in this movie and questions (laughs) I had about them and what they say about like America in like the Caribbean, Latin America, Central America, South America. You know, on, on, Juan Diego um, Bota, who pl- who played the you know the young president general, um, didn't have a lot to do, but I, I was glad that he got to be the hot guy <laughs> for mm-hmm. a, a little bit. Um, and it was it was even somewhat refreshing that he he actually had a, a thing for Harley. Like it, it would probably would have been uh, poking the door too hard if he tried to compare it to Evita outright. Oh, dude. Yeah. Dude, I feel so stupid. Why did I not think of this till now? That's completely that's that's it. But there's you know, there's no doubt he saw her as someone who could potentially to to him anyway, galvanize his regime because the people love Harley Quinn. I'm such a fucking it. I mean, granted, I've not watched Avita, but I fucking know Broadway stuff sorta. Like that is that she she has the red dress, you know? It's a fucking Evita tribute. Thank you, Art. They're on a balcony at one point. Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you for helping me see that. Okay, now I want to ask about where we think these alignments in this movie are and what they say about the politics of it. Because mm. maybe I am wrong to have read Corto Maltese as, as Cuba. Um, but the reason why... I, it just... It washed over me and I think like it's going to be kind of like fun. It was sort of fundamental to how I saw the movie because like the thing that didn't make sense to me, like there isn't one of these regimes that like overthrow there. There isn't an example I could readily think of uh, in terms of like a right wing anti-American like latin caribbean south american regime like those regimes are left-wing regimes like they wouldn't be overthrowing a u.s puppet like that had been entirely predatory like with an with with like a deep extractive relationship um to the to the population and then be um like they they might be frustrated with like certain aspects of like high-handed american imposition but like that wasn't what was happening here what what it like galvanized waller into executing this plan was that an anti-american regime had taken over and and that like usually happens like with a base of popular support rather than a base of support in the military and that accordingly made me question like what kind of freedom fighters are these? Because these are freedom fighters in the sense that America would consider them freedom fighters, which is to say they're Contras, which is to say they're like the 2506 Brigade, you know, fr- you know, from the Bay of Pigs. And then, you know, is like, you know, people in Miami who export like terrorism, like sometimes on behalf of the United States, sometimes not on behalf of the United States. Um, like similarly it it just made me think that like when they have the 
you know, the army enter the bar that like they're trying to say, like, we're not trying to mess with anyone's evening. There is a like invader force here. Uh, and if they're here, they're here to do a Bay of Pigs on us. So mm, we got to we got to go see who's around here. I like having them treat that regime as like similarly predatory on Cordo Malteze struck me as like maybe that was the part that either a gun didn't think through b the studio like insisted upon or c like this was basically just like an instantiation of american exceptionalism in a movie that has quite a sharp critique of it otherwise yeah i think it's hard for us to completely avoid that you know we we are very blinkered by our our lens here um you know i mean so I, that's an interesting question well the x factor here is uh when when after the death by harley you can see that the general's motivation for for gathering power um is that he has Starro in the pocket and that changes the whole equation mm -hmm. So you're probably right in that someone on the creative end didn't want to do that one-to-one -one application too closely. Um, and that's the value of a character like, like Starro. Mm. And that, you know, he can, they, sorry, um, and that their presence distorts a, a lot of, a lot of these normal questions. Um, and, you know, in the end, I got the read that America was forced for now to play nice. Because yeah. the world just saw a bunch of, to the layman, metahumans take down a kaiju. And there's Sonia Braga and a lot of conventionally attractive Latin Lat Latinx people in the streets happy about yeah. it. No, Waller is checkmated by, by the end, for sure. You, you, like, yeah. no, no, no doubt about that. Like, she didn't. Ultimately, she got, like, a justification she could live with. But, like, the the moment you really see, like, how far, like, America um, is willing to go here. Um, and, you know, to some degree, I am Greg Grandin pilled. I've, like, recently finished reading um, Empire's Workshop. And he makes the point that uh, the destruction America inflicts um, upon you know, Central America, South America, the Caribbean, Mexico. Um, it does so casually. It does so knowing that it can, as he refers to it, like use the fates of millions of people as a workshop um, for, for in, you know, previously anti-communism um, and then neoliberalism. And... Mm -hmm. That is like the moment I, I, you know, heard Waller when, you know, Starro is loose, you know, say like, look, this is an anti-American regime. And, you know, on some level, if it ends up, you know, killing people, you know, on a mass scale in an anti-American regime. Do we really care about that? I mean, it was so bold, so bold that they did that. Yeah. And like, yeah. Like generations of American policymakers, prop, you know, obvious, if they had a kaiju, would probably like view this similarly. Yes, the the, the kaiju is the cocaine trade. Um, <laughs> Look, I, I'm I'm going with embargo the conqueror. Mm -hmm. Like embargo, um, what <laughs> what what? That's a shirt. What what could we you know like more symbolize like the ways in which like. Okay, if we can't dislodge the Castro regime, we're not really going to pretend that we give a shit about the fate of Cubans. Like, we're mm -hmm. going to say it's your fault for not dislodging the Castro regime. It's your fault for not going along with every plot we've had to destabilize Cuba, you know, from, from Langley and from Miami. And we will kill as many of you we will starve as many of you. We will do this across generations. We will immiserate you. We will organize regional diplomacy in perpetuity against you. 
And it doesn't matter how many of you die. Like, there's no moral distinction between that and and Waller saying, like, you know, on the comm, yeah, you know, let 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 let, let Starro do do their thing. Well, so I want to take a question from Nicholas Slayton, who asks, uh, "Does she, she meaning which she, she, Amanda Waller, of course, uh, represent Cold War real politic, Bush era neocon, or just the Forever War writ large?" To me, the answer is yes, yes, yes. She's the com- she's the complex, right? Yeah. She's she's malleable, and it's remarkable that this character can uh, survive in these different eras and is in in so many different iterations. Uh, not just the comics, but CCH Pounder and Justice League Unlimited. Oh, so good. Uh, who is a who is amazing, but and you know she's in the perfect position. She's not head of a quote unquote recognized agency. Mm-hmm. She re- she reports to people. She implements policy or as as is interpreted um and and the other thing to go back to your point spencer watching that scene for me the unspoken beat there was well you know set your clock for superman because if he jumps in the government because because if he jumps in um let alone the whole justice league the u.s can wash its hands there too Hey, we didn't we didn't sanction them. What? Heck, Wonder Woman was from another from a whole other country, right? Um, so in that sense, it, it you know I, I I was kind of wondering how they're going to pull that off, which to me made uh, the Ratcatcher Gambit better as a film viewer. Hmm. Um, but to get, to get back to Amanda, uh, I mean, she she can she can be whatever you whatever America needs her to be. And it's often not good. (laughs) I mean, really, she's one of my favorite characters from the superhero genre, period. Um, Absolutely. You just don't get women that complex. And she's an interesting and powerful that that often. Um, I want to follow up with another question from listener Matt. Um, He asked, do you believe... All of these adaptations of Amanda Waller are one, are the Wallers the same person, just shown at different times in their life and different stories? Or are they different Wallers or self-contained and thus each different Waller story allows us and the viewers and readers to be in conversation with the different stories and the role such a character plays as the face of the system in different adaptations? For example, the 2021 movie is commenting on the 2016 movie Waller. Also, is the 2021 movie commenting on Waller from the comics or the animated adaptations? You know, as I said, like, we haven't really seen the 2016, but I, 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 I think, like, well, I, I don't want to just answer for other people, but go ahead. I think Waller is absolutely one of the great characters in comic books. And, you know, whether that Waller is in conversation with other Wallers I think that's a, f- a fun conversation to have. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't really know how to, how to go about answering it, but I think Ar- Arturo's point, you know, might be the way that, that that question is answered, which is that like Amanda Waller is the military industrial complex. Amanda Waller mm-hmm. is the figure who straddles the line between implementing policy deciding policy, directing policy, and then shaping perceptions about that policy. It is a tremendous canvas on which to uh, portray a variety of stories about what America does in the world because of where she is in that machinery, Arturo. You, you also say, I think, really um, aptly that like Waller doesn't run an agency like Waller has lots of bosses above her um, which tells you a tremendous amount not just about Waller's relationship um, with the system but what the system thinks about Amanda Waller which is always going to be gendered and is always going to be racialized and that like 
positioning of Waller um, within uh, the military industrial complex um, is, is so central, I think, to what makes her as, as, as rich um, and as vivid uh, and as portentous a character as she is. Like Nick Fury is not interesting compared to Amanda Waller. Like there's so mm-hmm. much more there with Amanda Waller. Mm-hmm. Well, to further your point, I, I, I don't know if the Wallers are in conversation with one another, but I think they provoke conversation within the reader or the viewer, depending on where you are when you catch each one. Mm-hmm. Um, and to your point, Spencer, about Nick Fury, absolutely. And uh, Alana, we talked about this yesterday in, in prepping. Um, you can argue where the bar is for these issues with this movie, but I don't think there's any question we wouldn't have gotten this conversation from a Marvel, Marvel movie. Yeah. Um, you know, and in, in Nick Fury specifically, we see him in the first Avengers film where he, he stands up to the council and, the, and diverts, uh, the, diverts the, the jet coming into New York, you know, and that lets, that lets a lot of people off the hook. In a way that Amanda Waller, when she's written well, doesn't allow for the reader for the better. Yeah. And like, I don't really buy that, like, a Nick Fury figure would have, like, stopped, Mm -hmm. you know, nuking New York in a situation like this. And like, you know, this isn't a, this isn't an Avengers podcast. But yeah, I think like the contrast with the characters comes out very well from looking. Um, at precisely that example. Yeah, totally. And um, let's talk about the back office workers in this. Um, it was really cool to have them included. Th- that's always been an important part of the supporting cast in the comics as well. Um, I did not necessarily see uh, getting having Amanda get smacked in the head by with a stick from one of the uh, government employees coming. Um, and uh, I, I I enjoyed having as much exposure to them in this as we did, uh, but I'd also was one of those like, is th- this was the one time that you guys questioned this was the bridge that was too far? I had a problem with that scene because like in that moment, like if we take like the world of the movie seriously, there was just a coup inside Task Force X, and like mm-hmm. Amanda Waller was overthrown, and the idea that the who participants um, would have like, like those people would have immediately been like, shall we say elsewhere in Bell Rev. Mm-hmm. Like if that, if that had happened, like from the public facing element of, of what was broadcast. Yes. Waller is checkmated against her own people. She most certainly is not like at that point, like seriously, I had thought at that moment, like we were at risk of seeing like on screen that they killed Amanda Waller because you can't leave Amanda Waller alive in a circumstance where like her underlings defy her. Like all of you guys are, 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 you know, out of there. I don't think we saw Storm Reeves character. Who's the one who nails Waller after that scene though. (laughs) <laughs> um, and there's also there's also the heavy implication that the two staff members sent to uh, keep an eye on Peacemaker in the hospital are stuck with him now. And I I, I would bet money they're going to be uh, on the show as playing the Greek chorus, basically. Yeah, I just think like that's a mistake. Like that kind of breaks, I think, a sense of of the character here that like. I I take your point now. I didn't I didn't think of it that way um when uh when the the final peacemaker scene happens that like this is how they're eating shit um for for what they did but like what they did was a coup. And the idea that such a thing happens like inside intelligence agencies without reprisal, like real serious reprisal, like they they knocked their commanding officer unconscious and like immediately like executed a massive insubordinate. It, like they, they reversed policy, whatever the Amanda Waller is either in this moment. I think the distinction is kind of, you know, without a difference, but like Amanda Waller 
is executing the policy of the United States. And because like all of this is in such like deep secrecy, she is functionally creating the policy of the United States here. And at that mm-hmm. moment, when they knock her out, they reverse that policy. Like there, the consequences for that are really severe. And like that was, was a, an aspect of the movie I, I kind of found uh, to be a bit of a problem. One follow-up question though. The scene with the, uh, with the staff betting on the outcomes that tracks is legit. Oh, right? I loved that. Oh, yeah. I thought like that totally. brought, that brought out the id of 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 the enterprise in so many perfect subtle ways that like this really I mean look it is probably not an accident that the Idris Elba character is named Bloodsport. All of this is treated as Bloodsport. Yes. And I I I thought it was a great scene. I um one of a, a listener asked a question about, do we feel like the movie did Mongol dirty by having her die so quickly? To which my answer is, and this connects to this, just so I don't, so like a completely out of left field. To which my answer was like, yeah, but in the in the betting pool, you had somebody say, is Mongol a supervillain or is she a god? And, and like, so, I love how- No, an d- alien, right? And then they're like, was she a god? An alien? An alien? Or, like they, god? they don't know anything yeah. about these people. They don't care. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. They are here not just to see- like stuff blow up i mean what is the what is the main the guy with the the white guy with the beard um i don't know if we if we got his name oh yeah that yeah like what is them yeah yeah what does the guy say when like really everything like goes wrong and like project starfish breaks out like excitedly we got a freaking kaiju up in this shit like Mm -hmm. he's he's viewing this like, I, I feel it's an excellent subversion and, like, truth-telling of, like, how, like, you know, they're channeling a certain kind of audience reaction that we are accustomed to getting through film. Like, this trope works in that way, and this trope conceals a lot of really ugly shit. This trope conceals that, like, you know, the same people after a while, because of the way media works, um, are going to be people in intelligence agencies whose view of what, you know, in important ways, the way the world operates is shaped by what they see intelligence operatives doing in movies um, when they are young and when it, you know, forms something of an early formative experience. And seeing them portrayed with the way that, like, you know, not to get too dark, but, like, I have, like, been in refrigerated um, like, uh, essentially, like tiny shipping containers, uh, with army warrant officers, and in the other seat, a contractor, like watching footage from an armed predator drone, and like I didn't see people, be I didn't see people like act in uh that crass a manner, um, but a. I'm a reporter and they knew that there was a reporter there and B the enterprise is crass. And that's what that scene really excellently uh, brings out. So those are the topics that I had on my list of stuff that we need to cover. There was a couple of requests that we got for uh, some of my suggestions of suicide squad teams that we might construct ourselves. I, I will say that, um, so many of the random ass DC villains that I know of, I know because I read a lot of Suicide Squad and Secret Six. So I kind of feel like in some ways my lists of who I'd have in there are derivative of stuff that you've already seen because that's like who I've seen in them. Um, like that, the, the those are the shitty rogues who I already know have, have been featured in those stories. But uh, I definitely tell folks like if you haven't read Gail Simone's Secret Six series you know she's got some you know daily eagle shaman art and then like oh my god you know the amazing nicola scott god gorgeous stuff uh i had a whole episode actually with uh, dread arminia where we just talked about gail simone's secret six um i fucking love it and i suggest everybody read those comics and check out the episode where i talk about them more um art do you have any drafts that you would add for your suicide squad team 
I don't want to do a full team because I thought that would drag us further into the weeds and <laughs> uh, it, it's past an hour. But, you know, my, my, my thought was I, I'd want to see the savant from Birds of Prey and mm-hmm. Kree out in that situation. Mm-hmm. Um, and as someone, a, a, as far as the story I'd like to write, I'd like to place them opposite Count Vertigo. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Because you've got two lovers working together in, in in this singularly shitty situation, and Vertigo as the old school operative, um, undermining them at every turn. I think you can do a lot from those three in that tension. And people just never people underestimate how insanely powerful Camp Vertigo is. Like constantly, I, I actually saw that animated Suicide Squad movie uh, a while back, um, and one thing I liked is I was like. I said, this movie understands how extremely powerful Count Vertigo is. Um, you know, I think that's an interesting dynamic. Uh, and, and I would also say, like, I, I thought it was interesting, like, seeing Savant show up in this movie, I was like, I hope, I hope Gail Simone's getting some money from this, you know, um, because she is the only reason anybody knows or cares about that guy. And it was kind of amazing seeing his... Uh, hair sheddings getting cleaned up by Bloodsport at the very start of this movie, as much as it makes me feel queasy to get it. Um, you know, I love anything, anytime we have an excuse to see some female furies show up. Um, I think seeing them fight back from a Suicide Squad team, like, would be, I mean, we had that in the original series too. So like I'm saying, like, I oh, mean, there's been so many Suicide Squad comics, it's hard for me to say anybody that hasn't already shown up before. Um, I don't know. Hush is someone who hasn't been in and he's a complete piece of shit and I hope bad things happen to him. So that might be entertaining. Right? I don't know. What what even powers would he have, I suppose? Perhaps there isn't one, but... Um... He's the hand-to-hand guy. Um, you could see him as, a, as an assassin. Yeah, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I just like, I, I fucking love Floyd Lawton. I love Deadshot, but I don't want him to have to go through all this again. And we did just get him out of it. And in the most recent series, I'd hate to be the one to put him back. Although I just do love the drama. So I, I, I will continue to read Suicide Squad comics as they continue to make them. Um, and I really did enjoy that recent, that recent um, relaunch. The new cast that they developed had some really cool, innovative characters in them. Um, including like non-binary characters and like really cool powers and a great big Puerto Rican queer woman who can like just fuck up anybody and is large and I love her. And she's like a radical because of course. You should buy Spencer Ackerman's book, Reign of Terror, and please subscribe to his um, Forever Wars and that you should also be sure to be following him on Twitter as I'm sure you already are. He is Attackerman, A-T-T-A-C-E-R-M-A-N. Um, and Arturo, where can our people uh, find you? And Oh, and Spencer's going to be on an upcoming episode of Cerebrocast, as will I, actually. Um, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to be on Cerebrocast to talk about Multiple Man, because, you know... If anybody is ever going to have to continually talk about how heartbroken they were about Peter David becoming a ma- being a massive bigot while having grown up reading nothing but his comics, it's going to be me endlessly. So, so yeah, I'm going to be on Supercast talking about Multiple Man soon. I know Spencer's going to be on talking about Professor X. Good for you. I'm glad someone's. I'm glad. Oh, sorry, I'm glad somebody's sticking up for Jamie. Oh well, sticking up might not be quite the <laughs> quite the. I have, co- he's, it's complicated. I appreciate stories that he's in. Not, not, not dissimilar from Deadshot. I appreciate stories in which he is in. So, yeah, so follow Spencer Man at Attackerman on Twitter. Um, and, and Arturo, uh, where can folks check out your work online? Uh, I am at trutherfiction.com. Um, I'm also uh, a contributor to another podcast, the uh, Michael Ford and the Racial Draft podcast, where a lot of characters, uh, Big and small get reimagined through a, an inclusive lens. All things are possible. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter, a boy named Art, A-B-O-Y-N-A-M-E-D-A-R-T, like a boy named Sue with Art at the end. Um, mm-hmm. I'm hoping to launch 
my own internet micro radio station by the end of the year. So hopefully I can keep everybody abreast of that project in the future. Awesome. And as for me, I'm on Twitter a little bit too much still. E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn. That's E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn. Um, I have an, gonna be on a I'm on an episode of Progressively Horrified talking about Hellraiser 2 that just came out. And of course, always at graphicpolicy.com. Uh, I had a new episode of my Deep Space Nine podcast come out, Deep Space Dive, which you can still get by being subscribed to the Graphic Policy Radio podcast. Please continue to uh, share this with others, and I'd love to get some new uh, reviews. And I appreciate your love and appreciate you guys waiting on this episode coming out. As we like to say, keep it geeky. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.